Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Samantha Reem, and I'm a third year student here at UMR. Thank you for coming tonight as we continue our May theme of conspiracy or critical connection. Just a reminder, and for those who don't know, UMR Connects is at 7 p.m. every Tuesday night. It's free and open to the public. Next week, we will have Jeff Moss, Program Coordinator of Metropolitan Council, presenting on how history impacts the shape and character of Minneapolis St. Paul. And if you haven't already done so, please sign in to get your name into our door prize drawing. The information is only used to let you know of upcoming events, and the winner will receive a $20 gift card to the M Gear store at the end of the night. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Sarah Walter is a visiting assistant professor in communication studies at Gustavus Adolphus College. She earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in 2012, and her research centers on analysis of mediated representations of female athletes from a critical feminist perspective. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Walter. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Get to wear a fancy microphone. Oh, this is a big deal. So, well, thank you so much for having me. A big thanks to the UMR Connects crew, um, and especially Ann and Sam, who have kind of coordinated everything here. I'm really excited to be back in Rochester because I married a Rochester man. Uh, so, Blake Kane is his name. So, some of you may know Tom and Carmen, uh, who are my in laws or who are his parents. And so, um, Carmen's in the back. And so, I'm especially excited to be back. And uh, Blake and his siblings grew up playing sports, they're big soccer fans family in town and so um, my father-in-law still coaches at Lourdes High School and so we get down here quite a bit for Lourdes games and just to visit and now uh, we'll be down here on Saturday for the Lourdes Soccer 5k uh, so we're very excited about that so uh, it's fun to be back in town uh, because of that so um, as Sam said my name is Sarah Walter I'm a visiting assistant professor at Gustavus Adolphus College uh, and I wrote my dissertation for my doctor uh, doctoral degree in a website called ESPNW and so it's ESPN's first dedicated site for women. Uh, and so you can imagine there's probably a lot going on with that. Uh, so there was a lot of interesting analysis with that. I'm a golfer by trade, and so I met my husband Blake at Gustavus when we were both students there. Uh, he was a soccer player and I was a golfer, uh, and as I golfed throughout the years, I played, I'm from Red Wing originally, so not too far away, but um, went to the state tournament a couple of times, played throughout my college career, and I started noticing some things about the golf course that were kind of interesting, and uh, as college athletes, we played from the white tees, which are typically called the men's tees, uh, and so it was always kind of odd to be, you know, women who are playing from the men's tees and people are like, you're playing from the wrong tees. Uh, or if you looked at equipment that was geared towards men, it was usually in colors like black or blue or gray. Um, and women's equipment was more pink and purple and some more pink uh, and a lot of that kind of stuff. And so I said, you know, there's really kind of some interesting things going on with gender uh, norms on the golf course. And so that kind of got me thinking. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on, uh, I guess, gender on the golf course in general. And so that got me thinking about uh, media representations in general. And so that kind of leads me into my research today. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, and so uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what um, what I'm going to talk about. So as I went through my high school and my college careers, um, female athletes and especially LPGA golfers in my or in my uh, my things not working. We can do this. In my case, maybe. Oh. All right, that'll work too. So um, we're really important role models for me. And so uh, especially as an adolescent girl growing up, it's not always the most positive body image time. And so it was a good thing that I had um, athletes as role models. And that was really important. And so again, that sort of got me thinking about um, this type of research. And so tonight I'm going to talk about a few different things uh, that I'll uh, go over. I'll give you kind of an overview of what media representations of female athletes look like um, based on some research uh, and that kind of stuff. I will talk about why scholars think that these uh, presentations exist the way that they do. Uh, I'll also talk about something called hegemonic masculinity, which is a really big word um, for something that's not quite as intense as it uh, as it sounds um, and then I'll also talk about the money involved in sports 
And then also what we can do to change some representations that are a little bit more um, troublesome. And so research shows that uh, depictions of female athletes, uh, and this is at most levels, so high school level, professional level, college level, fall into six different categories. And so the first category is this uh, athletic representation. And so the idea is that the picture is of the female athlete actually engaging in her sport. Um, and so she's, uh, you can see here, Abby Wambach is number 20, and she is heading a goal into the soccer net. This is during the 2011 Women's World Cup. Um, but you can see that it's really, uh, the athlete is in uniform, the athlete is in action, the athlete is on the court. Um, and these are, it turns out, are uh, usually the least common representations of what we see. And so the second kind is called ambivalent images. And so uh, it's basically an idea of, or an image where, you can tell that the person is an athlete because there's some clue in the photo that shows that that person is an athlete. And so you can see here, this is the Florida State women's basketball player um, who is holding a basketball. So we can tell that she's a basketball player because she's holding that. She's also sitting in the back of a limo in an evening gown. So I'm not really sure why. Uh, it's in their media guide. And so it's for when uh, uh, you know media personnel go and want to know for more information about the team. This is what they see uh, in terms of one of those uh, images. The third type is what we call the all-American girl next door. And so this is where um, there's not really any reference to athleticism, but it's more about kind of who that person is or who that athlete is in general. And so you can see a picture here of Michelle Wee. She's laying on a blanket on the beach, just hanging out with her laptop and some books, um, apparently reading. Um, but she's a, a, an LPGA golfer, but you can't really tell that um, based on the picture. So um, that's the third kind. The fourth is what we call hyper-heterosexual, and so that's where there's some reference um, to heterosexual roles like girlfriend or wife or mother uh, or that sort of thing. So the, the female athlete is pictured with some type of a um, relational figure. And so here you can see um, former U.S. soccer star uh, Mia Hamm with her husband, Nomar Garcia Parra. The flower, I don't know, that's a good question. I know, she must have just won a game or something because, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. You bet. All right, so the next kind, uh, number five, is what we call sort of close to soft pornography. And so this is um, a picture of, does anyone know who this is? Lindsey Vaughn, yes, very good. And so Lindsey Vaughn is known to be um, the best U.S. female skier in history. Uh, and she's, I wrote down some of her um, accomplishments. So she has the most World Cup victories by a U.S. skier. She's the first American skier to win three discipline titles in a single season. She's the first American woman to win a gold medal in the downhill at the 2010 Vancouver Olympic Games uh, and that sort of thing. So she has a lot of, she's amassed a lot of accomplishments. But what we see in this photo is a cover of Sports Illustrated and uh, she is dressed in her gear, but um, she's in a sort of a sexualized pose. And so Sports Illustrated caught some flack for this because of sort of its phallic nature. Um, also that she's turning her head and her hair is down, which I hear is not good when you're flying down the hill at 60 miles an hour, you know, so you want to be looking forward. Uh, and so it's, uh, you can see that uh, it's more of a sexualized pose uh, based on her face and that kind of stuff. No, they pull it all back because otherwise it would get in their face. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that and that's what, you know, part of what Sports Illustrated said, too. You know, they said, well, she's in her outfit that she would ski in. But then people came back and said, OK, but it's important that she's not really engaging in her sport. Or she's not really presented as an athlete. She's presented more as a sex symbol because of um, how she's uh, how she's presented and then the last uh, type of image is what um, we call soft pornography and so this is the german women's soccer team and so this is when female athletes appear on uh, publications like fhm or playboy uh, or that sort of thing where they're really not usually presented as athletes uh, they're definitely presented as sex symbols. And so these are kind of the six types of uh, presentations that we see. And what we see when we look at uh, female athletes in particular is that most of what we see in terms of media coverage is going to be the ambivalent pose. And so Michelle Wee laying on the beach, um, or it's going to be those sexualized poses. And so the one where uh, we saw the Playboy cover or where we saw Lindsey Vaughn 
uh, and the Sports Illustrated cover. And so it doesn't necessarily matter uh, uh, based on the um, types of uh, coverage that we see. Most of it is done on professional athletes, I guess. But um, within the professional athletes, we see two different types or two different themes emerge. And so the first is that, um, again, based on high school, college, professional, based on medium, so internet, television, um, newspapers, that sort of thing, we're going to predominantly see, or we're not going to predominantly see, I guess, um, any sort of representation of female athletes. And so female athletes represent about 40% of the population for most athlete groups. And so um, high school athletes, college athletes, and professional athletes, yet we see about 2 to 4% of media coverage um, in most of the big media outlets. And so um, ESPN Sports Center is even worse. So they did a study in 2010 that looked at um, ESPN Sports Center, and they dedicated 1.4% of their total coverage that year to women's sports. And so if you think about the reach of Sports Center and you think about how much Sports Center is on, 1.4% is really low uh, in terms of how much we're actually seeing female athletes. And they say the big deal about this is that we can't be what we can't see. So again, if we don't have those role models, especially for girls to look up to, um, you're not really going to have as much support, I guess, for, uh, for girls to be participating in sport. And so it's important to actually see these things uh, happening. And so if you think about the 1.4% in the context of tonight, so let's say uh, if we look at this presentation as about an hour presentation, uh, women's sports would have been covered for about 50 seconds out of that entire hour. Yes? Do you know what the uh, ratios are of the coverage that you're talking about of large money sports versus non-large money sports? <laughs> Uh, it makes a little bit of a difference. So the uh, the basketball, it usually depends on the league. So if there's a professional league associated with it, then they're going to get more coverage of it. So the WNBA, because they have um, a professional league, is going to get more coverage than a league that might not, or a sport that might not have a professional league, usually if we're looking at that um, type of a, of a representation. And I don't know the numbers necessarily for high school or college, but that would be interesting to look at if it was a rowing team versus, a, you know, a basketball basketball or uh, something like that. Yeah. I guess my question goes to the uh, coverage goes to where, where the money goes. Yes. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, women's sports or a lot of the sports where the 40% are, mm -hmm. are not those big money sports. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, well, that's a big thing. And the, and the argument goes, so again, if it's, uh, it's kind of a chicken and an egg scenario. So if we don't see female athletes and we don't see women's sports, population or popularity for women's sports is not going to increase. Yet at the same time, sports editors will come back and say, again, we have you know pressure, especially at the ESPN and the Sports Illustrated level and that sort of thing, that we have pressure to make money off of what we see. So we need to sell copies. And so if we need to sell copies and men's sports is the most popular, we're going we're gonna to showcase that because that's going to sell copies. So it's sort of a, um, like, say kind of a chicken and an egg thing where it's like okay we need to showcase more female athletes but I also think and I'll talk about this in a little bit it's because of how we define sports and so if we're going to define sort of the best of the best sports as this really aggressive masculine football type um, participation then women are never going to are never going to live up to men and never even going to have a chance you know so if we focus more on kind of the aesthetics and the finesse um, and that kind of thing I think women have more of a chance to be covered but it, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute here, it's it's so ingrained into our culture that it's really hard to think about how we can change that realistically, you know. So, um, so I think that we can, you know, start attending games. We can, you know, buy tickets and all that kind of stuff to help change that stuff. But I think from a sports editor's or a sports publication standpoint, it's a conundrum, you know, because it's the, like I say, the, the idea of do we cover women's sports and then risk not selling papers or do we, uh, you know, do kind of what the status quo is and then, sell you know make our money and so how do we kind of change society or change perceptions of society um, in different ways so one good uh, place is the NCAA March Madness tournament and so you'll see in terms of media coverage the men's teams or the men's tournament and the women's tournament are pretty similar in terms of coverage and so which is awesome because you don't see that in a lot of places and so you'll see um, the numbers aren't the same but there's more popularity geared towards the the March Madness tournament for women um, than there are 
you know, in other places and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, but it's a good question. You know, I don't, I, I would be much more famous if I knew the answer of that. And I would, you know, like, I don't know why, I, I wish I did, you know, but, uh, but yeah, to, uh, to think about that is, uh, is important. So, but uh, good question. So, all right. So, uh, so thinking about coverage, uh, like I say, they're most often represented or portrayed in ways that emphasize femininity uh, than their actual sports. And so the biggest criticism is that if this is a female athlete, how about we present her as an athlete and turn the video on and turn the, uh, turn the camera on and, uh, and that sort of thing and present her as a, uh, as a female athlete. And so that's one of the, uh, one of the biggest criticisms uh, of this. And so um, you'll see headlines like this one from the HuffPost celebrity uh, that says, meet the hottest women of the cold sports. These ladies are talented, more athletic than you or I could ever hope to be, and oh so sexy, and they are here for your enjoyment. Uh, or another example is Anna Kornikova, who is the internet's most searched for athlete despite never winning a major tennis tournament. Uh, and we can only assume in this picture that she's training for her next match, right? Right. Uh, and so then uh, that's uh, important to think about. Um, or when Men's Fitness puts out this type of a um, headline that says, it's no surprise that athletes and good looks go hand in hand. Whether they're catching waves or scoring goals, these women work tirelessly at maintaining their sexy bodies. And as spectators, we get to reap the benefits. Score. And so they also use these bodies to compete in sports, which is a very important uh, part of how they use those bodies and those toned bodies. So um, another example is from ESPNW. This is a woman named Jessica Jerome, um, and she is an Olympic uh, ski jumper. But uh, what we see on the ESPNW article is all about her relationship to her cats. And so she says, uh, when I'm on the road, my teammates will say how they miss their boyfriend or mom, and I'll say how I miss my cats. The article goes on to uh, quote her again when she says, every Saturday I wish all my teammates a happy cat Saturday and I'll wear my cat shirt. And she says that for the last two years they've thrown her cat-themed birthday party complete with drawn-on whiskers, a cat cape, bizarre cat-inspired gifts, and Hello Kitty birthday hats. I'm not making this up. This is actually in the article. Uh, and so she's also an Olympic skier. Yeah, uh, and so perhaps we could talk about that in the article, or I think that's a really important part that is missing in the article. And so it gets a little bit frustrating when you see most of these types of articles about female athletes when they're doing some really amazing things. She's an Olympic skier, you know, so this is a, uh, a pretty huge endeavor and takes a lot of training and dedication and that sort of thing. But we don't hear that as much. We hear more about her cat fetish. Uh, or her uh, important things about cats. Language is another way that uh, this stuff plays out. And so the research shows that female athletes are more often referred to by their first names. And so um, Annika or Serena uh, versus male athletes who are more uh, referred to by their last names. And so Jeter or Sabathia um, and that kind of stuff. And so they say that that's a, a, the last names are going to be more respected. And so um, the first names sort of make them not as professional. And so that's uh, an important part to think about. I think this is changing a little bit with kind of the branding of LeBron and Kobe um, and that sort of thing. But a second way is called gender marking. And so that's when we talk about a sport and we put the word women's in front of it. So when we talk about soccer, we're talking about men's soccer. When we talk about women's soccer, we have to call it women's soccer. Uh, and so if we don't have the women's in front of it, it's just presumed to be male uh, in the absence of that. The third type uh, is something called divergent dialogues. And so uh, this is basically when you see some sort of article copy, you talk a little bit about how um, it, something might be a little bit different. So it might um, use words like male athletes will be talked about as powerful, fearless, and incredible. Female athletes are talented, dedicated, and nice. Uh, and so it's just using particular words that, again, are not focused on athleticism or wouldn't necessarily contribute to their athleticism. Um, but they are uh, presented in that way, and it's sort of a way to be kind of sexist without being blatantly sexist. And so again, you're, you're looking at um, similar articles, but they're just written about in different ways where female athletes are not taken as seriously uh, as athletes. Fourth, uh, male athletes are more often attributed with skill. So if they win a game or if they do really well, it's based on how hard they trained or how much skill they have or how well they competed. Um, compared to female athletes. And then also um, female athletes are more likely to be the comments uh, or sort of the subject of comments about kind of overall attractiveness, emotional play, attributions of luck. So she won because she had a really lucky day today or she's lucky to have so much um, skill or something like that. So it's not based necessarily on how hard they've worked, 
uh, when in reality they presumably worked as hard as, uh, as male athletes. And so articles on male athletes represent some of these sort of things, but again, when they refer to what they're talking about, it's usually based on their athleticism and it's not based on their beauty or how they look. Uh, and so it takes away uh, from thinking about them as an athlete. And so I was thinking it's interesting to exchange male athletes for female articles. And so these are a couple of things that I pulled from ESPNW. And so um, this is a uh, one uh, woman named Ryan O'Toole. So uh, she's an LPGA player who made the Solheim Cup team and she was the last player to make the team and was kind of a surprise pick. Uh, for the team uh, in that respect. And so ESPNW wrote an article on her and say that, uh, they basically say that she's a 24 year old blonde from Southern California with a firecracker personality. And so if you replace that with a uh, male athlete, and so I just chose an athlete um, from the uh, Ryder Cup. And so if you say something like at the time of US Captain Tom Watson surprised at large pick a month ago, Jimmy Walker, a 24-year-old blonde from Southern California with a firecracker personality, uh, played in a grand total of seven PGA tournaments. So it sounds ridiculous, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, like why would you talk about his hair color or his personality in uh, being chosen for this team? But that's what they do in the female athlete article. So it's, I think that that's a pretty good tactic. So another example here is um, Simona de Silvestro. So they start off the article and they talk about how when she was four, she asked her dad for a go-kart uh, and she's an Indy car driver. Uh, race car driver and, and uh, he said no and so she threw a fit and so the end of the article ends with the line that they better because she's not getting out of the car until she gets her way and so I chose another IndyCar athlete and I put um, a male athlete name so Marco Andretti cried like a little boy when his father told him he couldn't race go-karts they better because he's not getting out of the car until he gets his way and again it seems sort of ridiculous and you're like why would you talk about a female a male athlete that way or any athlete that way but when you exchange the male athlete with the female athlete using the exact same words it shows kind of how ridiculous these things are and so one more example uh, Mariah Stackhouse, who is a 17-year-old golfer who was playing in an LPGA tournament, 156-player field. She was the only African-American player in that field. Um, they end the article that says, with tremendous parental support and personal drive, Stackhouse will have a future as bright as the multicolored Nike dry fit t-shirt she sported during our interview that read, Can't Stop Me. So a nice little um, name drop for Nike there. But then again, if we uh, replace it, and I took a young player from the PGA Tour and said, with tremendous, tremendous parental support and personal drive, Scotty Scheffler will have a future as bright as the multicolored Nike Dry Fit t-shirt he sported during our interview that said, uh, Can't Stop Me. So again, it seems out of place when you replace the male athlete with the way that you're writing about the female athlete. So I think that that's a good way to kind of um, point these things out. So I knew I would be coming to Rochester, and so I had my in-laws, uh, Carmen in the back here, collect the Post Bulletin for me. And I figured I would do kind of a mini analysis of the Post Bulletin, uh, and I didn't do anything super in-depth. So, uh, you know, qualifiers right away, this is from April 3rd to April 25th, and so uh, it's only three weeks, uh, and it's definitely at a point where um, the Wild were in the playoffs. There wasn't a whole lot, I don't know that many um, women's professional leagues that were um, in session, but here's what I found. And so I just looked at the articles on the front page of the sports section, and uh, I looked at the level of play, and so I looked at how many articles were on high school athletes, and I found 15. How many articles were on college athletes? And that was nine, and then how many were on professional athletes, and that was 27, and then I uh, termed my fourth category community events, and so um, that was thing like the, uh, there was a race coming up, or kind of a community race, and so that was four, and so um, I also looked at the sex of the teams that were portrayed, and so male athletes, there were 43 uh, articles about male athletes, there were eight articles about female athletes, and there were three based on um, both female and male athletes. On the court, uh, which is basically for the um, pictures, was the athlete pictured on the court actually uh, where you would play the game. And I saw 47 of the pictures that I saw were on the court, which is an amazing uh, percentage compared to six off the court. So that's a really positive representation. In action was about uh, half and half. So most of the players were in action. There were some that were um, on the court and maybe posed. So maybe it was a profile of an athlete or something like that. So the in the not in action, I also included if they were doing a celebration. So 
Um, it wasn't necessarily when they were playing the game, but maybe, you know, going over and high-fiving some um, teams afterwards. And then in uniform, again, was a really positive representation. So I saw 47 and then 7, and some of the not in uniform uh, ones were the community events. And so, like I say, when, uh, when I look at this, it's uh, with, you know, with the understanding that it's only three weeks, but it, overall it was pretty positive in terms of representation. And the only thing that uh, obviously stands out here is the male versus female. Uh, and I think that I, this is probably part of a larger problem. So um, like I say, the wild were in the playoffs, um, but when you look at the high school articles, there were 15 articles and eight of them, um, or half of them, were on uh, girls' teams. And so that's really positive representation in terms of portraying high school teams, um, both girls' and boys' teams. And so the articles that I saw um, with the girl athletes were um, there was a Casa Manorville softball team, uh, Mayo versus Century in softball, a lacrosse game between JM, Lourdes, and Mayo, UConn's women's basketball, all really solid sports reporting. And so um, two other articles were uh, about relationships in sports. And so one rivalry between the Mayo coach's daughter and uh, the daughter who plays for Century. Um, and then the uh, friendship between a pitcher and a catcher from Zimbrota Mazeppa. Uh, and then a couple different article on individuals. So a JM cross country runner, um, a woman who was the starter for the Fools 5 race, uh, and that kind of thing. And so again, um, what we see is that there are more representations of male athletes, but as you point out, there are a lot more opportunities for professional representations of male athletes in general. And so um, I think the indication of the high school articles as being balanced is really a positive thing uh, for the Post Bulletin. So I didn't look necessarily at wording uh, and that kind of thing, but like I say, the ones that were about female athletes were really pretty solid sports reporting. And so that was good to see. That's, uh, and we have a couple of representatives here from the Post Bulletin. So that's uh, kudos to you for, uh, for doing some great stuff. And so uh, in terms of sports, uh, or kind of back to the research, uh, typically the more masculine sports, the more pressure there is for females to exhibit femininity. And so in 2010, uh, the governing body of boxing, which is called the International Amateur Boxing Association, began handing out skirts to its female fighters. And mind you, these are people who are used to getting punched in the face for fun uh, because the, they said that on TV, you can't tell the difference between male athletes and female athletes. And so I'm not sure why you would need to tell the difference, but um, they said that this was a big deal. And so um, that was a, an interesting example of kind of a really masculine sport and trying to blatantly feminize uh, these women. It wasn't accepted as a rule after 2010, thank goodness. Um, so another example is what's called the Bikini Leagues. And so uh, the Bikini Football League, there's a Bikini Hockey League, two Bikini Basketball Leagues, thank goodness, the Bikini Basketball Association and the Beautiful Ballers League. Um, and there's the Legends Football League, which is uh, women's football leagues with team names like the Los Angeles Temptation, the Philadelphia Passion, and Minnesota has a team called the Minnesota Valkyrie. Uh, so you can see them in the cities. But they play in an official uniform that they say is lingerie with lace ruffles, shoulder pads, and a helmet. And that's it. That's their official uh, official uniform. And they hit really hard. So if you've ever seen any of this uh, coverage, it's, it's pretty intense. It's definitely full tackle football. And they're wearing um, what you see on the bottom here without their uh, their shoulder pads and their helmets on. So it's uh, the idea is that potentially their uniform will fall off, of course. And so there's also a uh, women's football league called the Independent Women's Football League. Uh, and most of it is on the West Coast uh, where they play in full pads. They look like regular football players. They full, play full contact tackle football. But which of these leagues do you suppose gets coverage on MTV2? The LFL, absolutely, right? So uh, it, it's interesting to, uh, to kind of see that. So, and again, you know, um, researchers will say this is really a backlash to women participating in what has historically been a really masculine institution of sport. And so um, it's kind of a way to, uh, to relegate that. And so the master narrative of these things is that basically sex sells. So sex sells everything. Sex sells women's sports. That's why we sexualize athletes. And so when people see sexualized images, they're more likely to go to games, they're more likely to go and support those athletes. And all research points to this not being true. Uh, and so there were a couple of researchers, Mary Jo Kane and Heather Maxwell, who put together focus groups, and they flashed up images on the screen, the ones that you saw um, in the beginning of this presentation, and said, if you saw this image, would you be more likely to go to a game, to watch a game on television, or to buy season tickets? 
Uh, and uh, the older males and all of the women were offended by the sexual, sexualized images and the ambivalent images. And the only group that said that, yes, this would uh, entice me to do something with the sexualized images was males 18 to 34. Maybe not a huge surprise, but they didn't say that this would make them go out and, you know, go to a tennis match or go to a basketball game. They said that this would make us go out and buy a magazine that portrays this, uh, this athlete. And so that's a really important distinction when we say sex sells or everyone's like, well, sex sells. That's why we do this. They're going to make so much money. Uh, it's an important distinction to think about. Um, how much it really sells the athlete themselves. And so it's a pretty uh, controversial topic. And so sexualization of athletes. And so athletes will come back and say, you know what, we work really hard for our bodies. We work out for a living. Uh, and so we want to show off that hard work. Uh, and so that's one side that comes in. They also say that there's a small window of opportunity where we can make money as athletes. And so we need to do everything that we can including being sexualized and getting, um, you know, endorsements that way uh, to make money while we have the time in our careers. And so uh, the other side, again, is, uh, would come back and say, well, when you're posing in these things, you're not furthering yourself as an athlete. And you also have to think about things like how are you a role model for girls at that particular point? Or how are you being represented in a larger sports media complex? So is that how you want to be represented? Is that how you want to be remembered? And so... Um, I think it's interesting to uh, to think about that. So we see that. And so we see that media sexualization is not unique to women. Uh, female athletes, so male athletes are definitely sexualized too, but most of the time when they're presented in sexualized uh, ways, it's based on kind of their muscles and their uh, things that they need to achieve their sports. And so you can see in this ad, this is Tom Brady, who uh, recently got in trouble uh, for some things. And so I didn't know that before I put this in here, but um, a smart water advertisement. But you can see he's very, uh, his muscles, you can see they're very shiny. Apparently he's sweating from doing his uh, push-ups and that kind of thing. Another example here is LeBron James, and so again, the focus is on his back muscles, and this is a Nike advertisement, and in the background, he's hugging the trophy, I believe, or the NBA championship trophy, um, so there's that. Another one uh, is Cristiano Ronaldo, and you see a lot of undergarment advertisements. I was really surprised at that with, uh, with the male athletes, but, um, but it's interesting to, uh, to kind of see that. And so again, looking at these, at these photos, the focus is really on muscularity and power, and they're still presented as really powerful men, and that is going to translate into doing well in sports. As opposed to women, it's presented more about beauty and about things that are not necessarily going to contribute to their um, doing well in their sports. And so that's a really important uh, distinction. And so again, I wouldn't be as troubled by the female athlete images if we had just as many images on ESPN showcasing female athletes as athletes. So we actually see them playing basketball or see them playing tennis. Uh, and that's definitely something that we see with the male athletes, but with the female athletes, it's way disproportionately more that sexualized image or the um, kind of ambivalent image. And so that's really the troubling difference between these two. And so when women don't sexualize themselves um, for participating in sports, they're often met with resistance. And so resistance can come in a couple different forms. So it's either lack of media coverage, which is very important if you're a female athlete and you want to get endorsements. Um, and then also uh, it's kind of a stigmatizing a lesbian label. And so questioning sexuality and saying, um, you know, if you're not going to sexualize yourself, well, then you must be gay. And so in the sporting world, if being gay or being lesbian is not as accepted as it should be, um, then that label is stigmatized, and so they're, uh, they're criticized for not enacting uh, kind of this heterosexuality. And so it's an interesting um, difference when we look at Jason Collins, who's the player on the left. So he was, in 2013, he was the first current male athlete in any of the four big leagues, NBA, NHL, uh, Major League Baseball, uh, and NFL, to come out as gay. And so he came out uh, and ended up being cut from the team a little bit later, but uh, but really looking at kind of the um, changing waves of acceptance of sexuality, it's interesting that it took until 2013 for a male athlete to come out. And there's all sorts of uh, interesting, uh, or not interesting, but um, kind of speculations for why we don't see more of this. And most of it is things like locker room culture, um, kind of enacting masculinity as a, as a sporting figure and that kind of stuff. But on the right, we see Brittany Griner. And so she's a WNBA player. She's a WNBA player who can dunk. Uh, and so one of the few players who can. And so she's a pretty amazing basketball player. But she came out um, also in uh, 2013. But 
you saw a very different media reaction. In fact, you didn't really see a media reaction. And the idea was that, I mean, President Obama called Jason Collins. He's like, that was so brave of you. This is amazing. All the media coverage he said has really been positive uh, and that sort of thing. But the idea is that, again, these how, how well they um, ascribe to traditional gender norms. And so a male athlete is supposed to be really masculine, and that's correlated with heterosexuality. And so when Jason Collins violates that, then it's a really big deal. And on the contrast, when you have Brittany Griner, who is uh, violating traditional gender norms or femininity to portray, portray masculinity, like I say, especially to do things like dunk the ball, um, it's not really a surprise when she comes out and she's attracted to women. And so a lot of this stuff really stems from how much they're portraying gender norms and how much those gender norms are connected to sexuality uh, and that kind of thing. And so it becomes even more complicated when you get to a case like Castor Semenya. And so anybody heard of Castor Semenya? Yeah, she's been in the news, uh, or was in the news, more in uh, 2009 and 2010. And so she is an athlete who was uh, an Olympic track star, uh, and she ran one of the fastest times ever in 2009, broke the world record. Um, but then she was subject to a whole battery of tests to prove that she was a woman. And so the tests uh, came back and basically said that she has no ovaries or uterus, but she has external female, female genitalia and she has some extra testosterone. And so she's sort of in the middle of what we would biologically characterize a man uh, and a woman. And so they say, well, what do you do in instances like this? Where does she compete? Uh, and so she's back competing. She's not as successful as she used to be. And what she had to do to compete uh, is sort of inconclusive but where does a person like Castor Semenya fit uh, in terms of how much our sport categories are defined by gender? So if she's not man, uh, a man and she's not a woman, how does that uh, sort of balance out? And so this winter, the Minnesota State High School League adopted a transgender policy too. So um, uh, transgender individuals can play women's sports now or can play girls' sports now too. So it's definitely a trend, um, but it's interesting to think about sort of how we... Um, how we define these things. And so uh, back to representations, uh, female athletes. And so uh, basically, the uh, I think that this all centers around something called hegemony. And so I won't talk too much about this because it gets a little in depth. But the idea of hegemony is that there's basically some type of a ruling class and our culture operates um, in the best interest of that ruling class. And so uh, the, the rest of us kind of go along and uh, are persuaded that this way of living our lives is the best way to live, when in reality it really benefits that ruling class. And so uh, rule, it doesn't come through force. It's not, you know, laws or, um, you know, mandates or anything like that. But the idea is that it's kind of woven into our everyday lives so that uh, when we are presented with these things, we, we kind of go along with them. So in sports, it's something called hegemonic masculinity. And so I put a definition up here, but... Um, the idea is that uh, hegemonic masculinity is, uh, is the idea that sport has historically been a masculine institution. And so to protect that masculinity, the ruling class of hegemony in sport is men. And so to, to make sure that men are sort of um, still on the top and still the ones who are benefiting most from sport, um, we're perceived or it's perceived to be that um, the aggressive sports, the ones where men are going to excel with their bodies, uh, and power and that sort of thing are perceived as the most popular sports or as the best sports. And so um, we're kind of, you know, asked to be drawn into this uh, in particular ways. And so female athletes might be kind of, you know, left by the wayside, but the perception is that um, this is the best way for all of us. And so uh, it gets a little confusing, but I think a couple examples illustrate this pretty well. And so the first is something called the Cover Girl Glam Up for Game Day campaign and so as you can see this is something that covergirl who is the official beauty sponsor of the nfl i don't know why they would need to have that in the nfl to have an official beauty sponsor right so um but the idea is that um the people who are as you're getting ready to watch the game you should engage in these makeup configurations so that you look your best for the game and so i'm going to show you a quick commercial here that uh is the it up here it was here um.
so they're very intense about their makeup and so um, this is the home page so you go here and you can see you can uh, catch the fandemonium on the bottom and so you can choose your team your NFL team and you can get your makeup ready to go based on your favorite team so again this is to watch the game this isn't necessarily to um, attend it uh, and that kind of thing so they see things like, like their hair section that says try a super high ponytail or, or pigtails that could only be matched by a cheerleaders pom-poms you'll look fun and feel flirty whether your team's mascot is a lion panther eagle or ram in purple orange gold or green find a hair accessory or two and incorporate it into your hair look you can buy ribbons with animal print or in your team's colors wrap a printed headband or bandana around your head for team support in a carefree style or braid them into your hair um, so lots of great advice on how to look good for watching an nfl game and so uh, I'll show you a couple other examples here. Um, this is the Minnesota Vikings. I wanted to make sure that we were all set for our home time team. Um, and so if you think about your next Sunday football watching party, you can show up with purple eyebrows and see what happens uh, with that. See if they, don't, uh, if they don't kick you out. And then when you go into it or you click into it, you have a few different things. It tells you, instructs you exactly how to do this. And so they use words like starting line, sideline, goal line, uh, get the fanic here. There's a pro tip um, about smudging eyeliner um, or something like that. And so they, uh, they really set you up or set women up uh, because it's targeted at women, presumably, who are going to wear uh, this makeup um, to protect, I would argue, with sports as a masculine institution. All right, are we back? My battery might be done. That's okay. But anyway, we got, uh, so it's set up. To
Tina. She's going to give us some tips on how to look good and set your table at the same time and make it very, very team forward and look pretty at the same time. Now, Summer, can you walk us through this beautiful table behind you? It is it's actually very easy, and I will walk you through. It's called the coordinating. So it's your decor, but you're the coordinator of it. And it really all starts with what you're wearing. So you need to have allegiance with the team. you got to become a fan. And if you already are a fan, the NFL Women's Apparel has some really cool stuff. So you can be a fan and look good at the same time. So that's my Niners stuff. So that's your 49ers. So I'm guessing you're a big 49ers. I grew up a Niners fan. I grew up in the exact same town where they had their summer training camp. Okay. So all the players would come in the swim pool when they had time off, which was really fun. So it was very connected to the Niners. But I go two ways. My husband is a Bills fan, so I am now a huge Bills fan. So you have both now. You have both, but that can be fun when you're the coordinating. So when you come into our table over here, which we have set up, you have to establish kind of a home field advantage. Since you're not at the game and you're watching the game, this is your opportunity to have the home field right in your living room. And then when you look at this stuff, the cool, like the cheese board over here, the glasses that have the Niners on it, Oh, wow, I didn't even see that. Some of them are red tinted, which is the color of the Niners. Oh, okay. Obviously, it all starts with waving your flag. So if you have a San Francisco flag behind you, you're sort of establishing before anybody even walks in the door. Now, you're with, a 49ers fan. now with the food, do you want to put food that the state is known for, the city is known for, or do you want to just put anything oh, that's you want? interesting. That's